you can argue that, yeah, there's exclusion. That's the only interaction. And that's the only thing. If they don't, if they allow to argue by the same side, you literally have what Sid was telling you earlier, random diffusion of things. You can ask interesting questions as well, but at least you don't have to worry about the fact that there are longer particles. Okay? So, the rules are extremely simple. You simply pick a, uh, a pair of sites, and if it is a particle whole pair, you just exchange them with rate one, except for the jumps that are against the field. So this guy doesn't want to go here, but he's very happy to go down to the other side. Similarly, this guy doesn't want to go there, because he's trying to go to the left, remember? And you have to go there. If you pick this particular pair, it just goes to rate one. So, that's about as simple as possible. Just jump anywhere you want, except for the ones that are going in the opposite direction, opposing the field. If you pick a pair of particles, then uh, we sometimes let it go and sometimes don't let it go. And you can set gamma <coughs> equal to zero, in which case it will not exchange at all. But if you pick gamma to be non-zero, then for example, you can exchange these two particles because of periodic gravity conditions. These two, on the other hand, when you want to exchange them this way, they would go with rate gamma. Had it been opposite, unfortunately, I didn't have a pair uh, the other way. But if you want to go the other way, again, it would be suppressed a little. So this is an unbelievable simple set of rules. And you ask, with this kind of situation, what are the control parameters? You can change the, the uh, width, how many lanes you have, how long the road is, how much you are suppressed by going backwards, and then this possibility of gamma. And then the only other control parameter is how many particles do you put on the, the system, and then what is the difference of the number of particles you put on the system. That's it. That's the only control parameter in this game. Most of the time that I will talk here in this uh, simulations and so on will be half-filled neutral. Okay? So equal number of pluses and minuses. So uh, if you want to have something that is uh, familiar with uh, what you are or something to associate with what you're familiar with is that imagine there are fast cars and slow trucks on a multi-lane road and you go into a co-moving frame with the average velocities then the trucks look as if they're going this way and the cars look as if they're going that way every now and then a car overtakes a truck and they have an exchange like this okay and if you have that in mind then you do not want some long division that would cause a lot of problems okay what happens if you have a one-lane road? Well, this is a one-dimensional problem. Turns out there's that exact solution. And again, it's very recent, uh, even though it was uh, a few years before that. And what they show is that if you put a number of cars and trucks in you know, these particles on this thing, then the density is always homogeneous. The average density is always homogeneous. In other words, there are no transitions whatsoever. In addition to that, you can talk about it a little bit more, and you can say uh, the clusters, we don't care about what sign they are, just how many cars are packed together, or cars and trucks are packed together, and it goes down and it's an exponential with a uh, correlation link that you can calculate based on the microscopic. So here's a picture of what it looks like. Um, it's just that when we did the simulation in those days, we didn't have colors. So the black lines, uh, by the way, each one of these lines is a particle because if I actually try to show you a single pixel, you couldn't see what's going on. So this is actually a single um, uh, particle and the black one is trying to move this way. Here's a gray one that's trying to go that way. Okay? And they run into each other, makes it clump. And inside, they're trying to overtake each other on charge exchange in here. And then at the other end, they go like that. And you can see there's a distribution of these cluster sizes. And that's exponential and nothing much happens. In two dimensions, so think of this as a monkey lane road now, there are only monkey color results and only mean field theory type of uh, explanation. And we've been playing with this kind of game for a while now. And what happens is that in the, um, because you have more than one dimension, you can look at NLS entropy now. And they are anomalous and long range and so on and so forth. I'll tell you a little bit about that. In addition, they can then go into jam states. <coughs> And there are a variety of these jam states, and here's what this mountain of all the problems and so on is, is about. And in addition, this kind of transition can be both continuous and discontinuous. 
In other words, when you have discontinuous position, you can develop hysteresis and things like that. And then there's interesting, what's in the phenomenon, and now I'll tell you and that's what the word clouds refers to. Okay, we have set up a continuum theory, and it's qualitatively adequate in the sense that it is able to predict the transitions, it's able to predict certain things, and as we go on, uh, you will see what, we're, we're, what I mean by what we can do. But it has its limitations. Okay, I've turned the year around for a reason, which you'll see uh, a little bit later, hopefully you can manage. Um, so the white guys are trying to go down, and the black guys are trying to go up. And here is the situation to say that obviously what is happening is that the white guys are trying to go up, the black guys are going to go up, and they would bump into each other, and uh, they can go by and keep going like this. And if they are small enough um, uh, particles in the system, or small enough drive, they would just bump each other and go around, and nothing be interesting would happen, and there would be no jams, and hopefully it would run, and can you see that more or less there are white things falling down? You don't see the black guys going up, but that's it. Remind me, the particles don't move sideways. They not go down. The white goes this way and the black goes this way. Only up and down. Only up and down. I just turned it sideways. Oh, they turn it sideways. They're not turning. They're not biased in the sideways direction. The sideways direction. Just pick a pick a pair this way or that way. That that way you can just change and that way you can deal with what is in the right direction or the wrong direction. Okay? So you can see this is rather uninteresting, but it looks kind of nice and we call it slow mist. As you can imagine why we might like to do that. Now, that disorder state looks terribly uninteresting, but it has weird structure factors. Okay? Let me remind you what a structure factor in a homogeneous system, okay, like a gas. Suppose you ask for the density, density correlation functions, and you fully transform it. What you have, well, remember we talked about Lorentzians and Einstein Zeneca and exponential decays and so on. If you, you can see that this comes from the 90s for this picture. So that's what the structure factor looked like plotted against the case. So are these two identical just rotated sides. So if you go in, in the direction of Kx, you reach the same height as you go in the direction of Ky. It's perfectly isotropic, nothing happens. For this particular system, the first, there, first of all, there are many of these correlations. The first one I want to show you is plus plus. And plus plus already looks really weird. You see? If you're going in this direction, you reach a different value than if you go in that direction. Okay? So, there is lots of the things. One is that you're positive, that's not true because of positivity. And as a topic, that's not surprised, is from here the origin you already uh, um, know about from the first lecture, from the second lecture. So they're generic and they have to do with violations of FPT. Now let's look at something else, plus minus, okay? Plus minus is quite a different story. I'm going to show you, first of all, it's complex in general. It doesn't have to be positive anymore, it's, there's no positivity. So I'm just showing you the real part that is plotted here, and as a topic, no surprise, this continuity, no surprise, but why? They can change signs. Look at these guys, they're negative here, they're negative, and then something goes positive, and this one goes negative, positive, and negative, like that. It's pretty amazing. It just comes out of the one description. So by now, uh, you've heard many of um, uh, Christina's lectures, you should know about Langevin equations and continuum theory and so on. You write out such a theory and then you can just add noise and then you would get all of these things. So we were very happy about that. However, when we look at the imaginary parts, it also predicts that the, all the imaginary parts are always positive. And we would love to know, have some feeling as to why, what's special about the imaginary part. We haven't looked at that yet. It's probably not something that we, uh, would be difficult to do, but it would be nice to be able to show that, oh, it has to be positive because of this and the other. So, let me, um, so you, by the way, let me just comment a little bit. Uh, when you get a negative structure factor, what in the world do you mean? Well, it turns out that this thing is a, the average of structure factors. And what I mean by that is that you run the simulation, you have a sample, you calculate the, the fully transform, 
and you run another time, you calculate another one, you calculate another one, and so on. And so you actually have a whole distribution of these guys, a distribution of structure factors, and the positive ones, uh, and, and the, the, the distribution turned out to be exponential on both sides, and this exponential is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, and depends on which one is positive, which, which side is bigger, as to whether the average is bigger or was larger than zero and uh, less than zero. So it's quite a complicated situation, which I'm not going to go into anymore. Let's now come to the uh, story that we want, that, that make up the, uh, this, this picture to begin with. If you now start to make big enough meat or large enough ends, so start to fill it, then this is what it's like when you run the system. After a while, it goes into there. And by the way, we have a, um, uh, one of our students nicely wrote up um, a script, so I have that demonstration here, and if you want to stick around at the end, you can play this game at the Infinite. Okay, you can fill it with whatever you want, which leads to whatever you want. And now, I'm sure that you will see why I call this an American football, because what happens there is that people get up, they try to go in all other directions, they crash, and they stop in the middle. And this happens over and over and over again, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> now, before I go on to balls, let me ask you, suppose you play the American football game with multiple white guys and black guys, what's yes. going to happen? Well, you would imagine that the white guys would win and would then push the black guys out of the way, right? Well, think of the rules that we have chosen is such that the white guys retreat. So the whole thing drifts like this. Okay. So it, it's surprising to begin with, but in this case, it's not so difficult. It's a little bit about it, and, and it's fine. So at the time uh, that we were playing with these things, I was also very interested in interpretational phenomena. And you know that this jam can occur anywhere because of the periodic boundary condition. Up here, 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 and so on. So if I take a lot of samples of these things, they would jam in different places. If I were to put them together, what's going to happen? Is it going to then, you know, somehow tie each other together? Or is it going to go flat? What is going to happen? And so we sort of say, all right, let's look at samples in which one direction is very different from the other direction. So the aspect ratio of the sample is very different. I was looking for waves. Instead of waves, our postdoc at, at the time came to me and says, you know, I'm finding barber poles. And I said, what are barber poles? And he says, they look like this. They sometimes jam into a into a tilted stick. I said, no, 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 you must have some bug in your program. He said, no, 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 this is right, and so on. So we argue a little bit, and finally we agree that it's right. And where does probable come from? Well, you notice periodic boundary conditions, so you take the strip here and wrap it around like this, and you notice periodic, so you can duplicate it, and what you see is a strip that lines up, right? So, and in addition to that, Unlike this system, where the particles come here and have nowhere to go, this one actually has a residual current because the particles will come here, goes down here, goes up there, goes down here, and it goes down like this. A steady state with a, a, a current. So this is the critical aspect ratio, but it goes from the American football, so you know it's power. It's coming. It's really coming. Let me tell you about the cloud sphere. So you may ask, how does the system that falls off the zoom get in here to begin with? And so I take the system, and now I evolve it. And now you see why I chose the color, we chose the color that we chose. We have clouds. So that's the, uh, that's not, not that you know what I'm talking about, we can go on. Are there any questions about this? Analysis? The only difference is the size between clouds and clouds. This is not the end state. Okay. It's keep going closer. So we have to let things like this run over the night and then go to the It depends. When you do a deep infinity, we can never go backwards. So it very often then freezes into two American football-like things and then it's time. It's just dead. And do it so. 
But if you let E be finite, then it will eventually undo itself and this will go straight. Can you say something about the right scales in the cloud formation? Uh, it's coming. That's the course in the issue. So it seems uh, these pictures are from, like uh, mostly from the periodical boundary condition. Yes. So did you try a very thin, like a real high west? Oh, you mean with in and out? With, with things coming like in and things You make out? it very thin and very long, so you don't need to worry about the periodical boundary condition this much. Uh, you mean you don't want periodic this way and you want it very long and thin? Yeah, it would, it would then. Well, okay. If you make it, let's say, 10 this way and let's say 3,000 that way. Then what happens is that these little clouds will find themselves and immediately go across the band. They go into lots of little bands. And then if you don't have E equals infinity, these little bands will eventually cross them extremely slowly. Yes? So stupid question. You, your particle number is conserved? Yes. And you have purity boundary. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is really the fair bone situation. You don't, once you open it, you remember it's doing one dimension of DBS. Once you open it, then life gets miserable. Any other questions? Good. All right. So, what can we say so far? This order states would be the answer we know. These transitions actually can be predicted. And with this uh, mean field theory that, uh, if you insist, I will tell you about at the end, OK? So we'll just go on for the time being. However, here's the question that you um, are asking. So this bottle hole is actually not, I mean, you can think of it as a bottle hole if you like. But the other way you can think about it is that you can take the uh, configuration and wrap this, this way first, OK? And then try to wrap it into a torus this way. Okay? So once you wrap it this way, you have a choose. So the ordinary American football state is like taking a yellow strip going down in the middle, and then you put it together. The, the bottom pole state is like taking it, rotating it by ones, and then put it together. You can imagine taking garden hoses and doing this very easily. So that tilt that you see, it could be thought of as a winding number. If it goes up once, then it's winding number one. If it goes like this, it's winding number zero. If it goes two strikes before it touches, it's winding number two, and so on. Yes? Uh, I'm just wondering, could you go over the procedure for calculating the S phase again? Because you said that basically you, act, you took a sample, you did a Fourier transform. Oh, yeah, yeah. You take, so you, 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 so you, you, you do a run. That and you take the average of the functions? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, you do a run. And at, at uh, every, let's say, 100 Monte Carlo steps, you, you take the configurations and you do a Fourier transform on that the number from one zero one zero one zero you can cut either an k uh, x and y and multiply by either one and zero and uh, you get then the Fourier transform of the density you square you your absolute square the object and now you do it again and again and again and again and again and if you were to average of the whole thing that's what I was showing you. Okay. If you don't have everything the same weight as empirically averaging, it's empirically averaging over every, every discrete weight number, is that the idea? Yes, yes. You take the k and you do it again. Yeah, you yeah. take another k and you do it again. You take another k and you do it again. It's all so okay. okay. The idea of that, of course, is that it's related to in experimental situations where you do scattering. And remember, this s of k is the scattering pattern. And so if you take very rapid snapshots, you get a total mess. And that total mass is called spectrums. And you can look at the spectrals. And when you do the average, then you get this nice, beautiful house shape that was kind of the bottom. OK, so there are a number of things that we don't understand that is in this, uh, this red. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll now talk about it a little bit. OK, this is the method. So uh, to answer your question, we did a lot of simulations in which the, uh, the um, horizontal direction Remember, the drive is still this way for the time being. Our final direction is 100, and then we change this direction uh, from 1 to 30. We can go all the way up to 100, in which case it would be square. So 10 means 1 this way, and 10 that way, if you like. And the black represents, and we run 1,000 initial configurations and ask how often does it go into an American football state, and how often does it go into a 1-1 state, and so on. 
then this is a very interesting plot because it suggests that there is a way in which it suggests that there is an attraction of the domains of these two things, if you like, in which uh, if it is 10 to 1 to 10 ratio, four fifths of the time will become a bubble pole, and then at 1 to 7 ratio, it's the best for getting a bubble pole, and then after that, it starts to not have anything anymore, and the very first things that we did were sitting at 100, which is over here, which is why we never saw a bubble pole to begin with. Okay? This um, pattern is, this, this uh, 1 to 7 ratio is so favorable then we even had two runs out of a thousand in which it uh, locked up into a um, winding number two step. We were actually playing. Does this affect in any way density dependent, like you increase the uh, concentration uh, of the white black? We have that. This is always one now. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, just takes a lot of runs to get the number of the So that would be an interesting question. Now, I have. Um, we have spent quite a bit of time, or we have spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how we can predict such a distribution. No idea where to get there. Now, you remember that I was waving hands before like this. I can try to wave some hands about why 127 is important. Yes? Just a quick question before that. Yeah. If the winding number gets more and more vertical and becomes, you know, straight up and down, is that just called American football again, or is that called... Uh, American football is so maybe it's zero, because if you don't, it's flat. But I if mean, you change the aspect ratio and it gets really, really steep in the slope, wouldn't it just look like American <coughs> football again in the other direction? Oh, okay. Um, all right. So, let me see if I understand your question correctly by restating it. So, if you change the aspect ratio, the bubble pool would get steeper and steeper. That what you're worried about? Right, and what if it, and then right. as you change the aspect ratio, it just looks like the same thing. Right. So the, the, the slope of the bubble pole is dictated by the aspect ratio. That's understandable, right? Because of the period of boundary condition. First of all, is that okay? Yeah. So the, the slope is dictated by purely the aspect ratio. If you have uh, a winding number one, it has to go from corner to corner. Okay? And now, by the time you get to a square sample, a bubble pole would have to be 45 degrees. Okay? By, by contrast, the winding number zero doesn't care a thing about the aspect ratio. You can get as long as you want. Okay? Is that what's sure? so You can get as long or as short as you want. You just so what happens when the woman is the winding number goes to the um, Well, then you go like this. <laughs> Yeah, okay. We never see that. I think the answer is it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up. You don't see that. The best thing you can do is the winding number two. So what it does is you make this as the aspect ratio goes in closer to square, it goes back to the standard factor. Just as a final Yeah. One thing I can address, considering this thing, is that if you make it longer and thinner, and just keep making it going like this and starting like that, what is going to happen is that locally, find one of these bubble pots. Okay, it would try to go like this, say. But then it can go like this as easily as it can go like that. So you can you can take the strip and look at locally, it look like a winding number plus, a winding number minus, a winding number plus, a winding number minus, and so on. And what you see is that the plus and the minus can annihilate. But the plus means it's going like this and a minus means like that. And they can find each other and they go to zero. Okay? So, somehow, it does this, and then you would have lots and lots of easy fingers, and then it's kind of poisonous. Any other questions? Yeah, what did you do to, to understand, to try to understand? Mm -hmm. What did you do to try to understand? Try to understand this distribution? Yeah, what did you do? To, I mean, you said you tried to explain it, but what did you do? Okay, the only thing that we try to do is the following. If you have a particular aspect ratio that, and that is favorable for picking up uh, things like this, it means that there are natural slopes in the system. Right? If somehow the microscopic loves the slope of 1 to 7, then this is very probable. Right? Why would 1 to 7 come up? If you look back at the clouds, I mean, you can imagine what the clouds look like. The clouds have tips at the end. 
and the chips at the end look like they are one to seven. It's not exactly one. It's only as to my eye and so on. Remember, this is hand waving. Okay. Now, you ask, how can I possibly get such an angle out of looking at clouds? And the answer is, do you know about the angle of repose for sand dunes? You know, the, the sand dunes have a natural angle, right? So, if you think about a sand dune at the edge of the sea, then it, whatever comes in this way, you just fall off. Now we have a slightly more complicated problem. We have sand on top of helium balloons. Sand wants to go this way, helium balloons wants to go that way. If the angle is too narrow, like this, it's easy for them to find through, and it would thicken. Agree? If it is very thick, this stuff would fall down and would, it would jam and go there. Some way it balances. And I didn't know how to find this. That was fun. So, so is it like some kind of self-organized criticality? Well, like, I wouldn't what call it self-organized criticality. There's nothing critical about this system as far as I can tell. But it's certainly finding some kind of stability. It's thin, it doesn't like it. It's thick, it doesn't like it. Somewhere in the middle, it likes it. How do you find that number? But it didn't take into account the time it takes for the particle to to do one period, something like that? Um, I don't think so, because the class don't, doesn't depend on the periodic boundary conditions. I was wondering, uh, does it have any dependence on the probability for it to go to one side or the other? Like, if you decreased the probability of a sideways move, so oh, that it would only be oh, so fast? Make, make them, I'm, I'm sure, because uh, at one point or another, if you don't make them go sideways, they're not going to do that oh, at all. Of course, but so, I mean, if you slow so it down, it's sped it up a we lot. Did, we didn't try that. It's step in the context of the very last piece of this talk. Okay, no, no, if we get to the last piece of this talk, okay. you will get a little bit of your answer. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right, let me go on to the next piece, which is coordinate, which is to answer um, um, six questions. So you remember that it's going on, you know, and makes clouds. Very nice. So we watch a lot of coordinated uh, way of understanding what's going on. What I'm showing you here is it looks like one picture in this thing. Right? Here's the thousand by thousand. <laughs> and I'm sure that all of you have noticed already, especially if you stared at the public lecture thing a little bit more carefully. This is that guy. This is this guy. And this is that guy. And this is uh, T of a thousand after the starting at random, 4,000 and another factor of coordinator. And what I'm trying to show in this picture is obviously the fact that there is visual cell similarity. Okay? So now let's be specific. We're going to look at now the structure factor. In particular, we're going to look at the structure factor K is equal to zero of K. And at early times, it is quite large. Remember, the peak of this thing is measuring the uh, size of the cluster. Right, the size of the clouds, if you know. So large K means small clouds, and as time goes on, this clouds get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is increasing time. If you take this set of guys, we scale both S and K so that peak sits on top of each other and do a lot of block, that's what you could like. This is what we mean by dynamic scaling. Okay? This is truly what you mean by, at a later time, if you rescale the distance, you will get the same structure factor. I was not confused with that K is there, but it's K uh, Y, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, in one, I'm one sorry, K, okay. did I say it the other way around? You didn't say anything about K, what K is. This is K X is equal to zero, and this K is K Y. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this is that could be good. Yeah, sorry about that. But I was about to say something else, and that is no other scaling has been found. Nothing else. Not one, not two, not zero, K X, and so on. So forth. And this means the following. Only the bands of coordinate, kx equal to zero, means you first do an average this way. So think of it as bands, okay? The local density on a band. Somehow it's coordinate only in this direction, despite the fact that visually it is seen to be coordinate in all directions. <coughs> we don't have a good explanation for that uh, whole uh, scaling function except for large k. And here is the really bad part. That beautiful continuum theory that we were able to use to describe transitions is absolutely horrible. 
it's really horrible. And we have no idea why it's so horrible. It's no, no worse than the first thing that I told you about in the continuum equation. It doesn't get toe glasses, it gets icicles, and things like that. Is this expression for alpha and beta? Hmm? Alpha and beta, the values? I don't remember the science name. I don't know. Well, nothing but nothing but it's really meaningful. I mean, there's some stupid number. I mean, we couldn't. Right. The, the, the continuing equations is just completely different, okay? I mean, it's nothing like this. So we have no idea what's going on. Okay. Any questions so far before we go to uh, go to the next group? Good. <laughs> Still, the state of affairs. Where the state in one dimension is nice, it's exactly soluble, disorder, no transitions, boring, end quote, quote, end quote, quite an understanding. Two dimension is very exciting, new states, and so on. There are many things that are not understood. So it begs the following natural question. The Isaac model is not ordered in 1D, but ordered in 2D. How does the crossover occur? What happens if we gradually go from one lane to uh, many lanes? So the natural thing is to study two lanes to begin with. Right? Guess what? Wham! I <laughs> did. So here's the one lane system that you've seen before, the ordering and so on. And here's the two lane system. It jams. Just adding one lane jams. <laughs> and now that comes back to your question. If I prevent this car from going over there, it would of course not jam. It would be two independent ones of these guys, right? So we'll come back to that later. It's okay. And it's really quite true. Now just to give you some details of the two lane system, <coughs> first of all, we are only doing one half here. They never go backwards. They have a possibility of exchanging one every 10. Okay. And then we did L's all the way up to 10,000. The, with these parameters, the length of the jam is about half the size of the system. In other words, it eats up uh, 90% of the particles are in the jam, and 6% of them are what we call powder. So in other words, this part of it is the jam, and the rest of it we call powder, because there's some in the lab. Where does this 6% come from? If you use just a hand waving argument, you can come to 2 gamma over 2 minus gamma, or the gamma over gamma. It's reasonable. I mean, it's a uh, back of the end of the calculation. So now, what we really want to quantify what is happening here is uh, sometimes called the resonance distribution. Sid has talked about it already. It's not just the uh, probability of finding a cluster of a certain size, but L times the probability of finding a cluster of that, that size. That stands for essentially the probability to find a particle to be a cluster of rates L. Okay? And this is a concern uh, quantity for us, normalizing it. The resonant distribution of these things have two pieces. Exponential green is the catalyst because the um, red is the jam. So here is now simulations from a whole bunch of different size systems. Exponential you can probably see is just sitting in the corner over there, but I just want to show you the fact that here is the cluster that is jammed. The, this stands for the probability to find a particle in a cluster of size 249 in the 500 class, okay? Now, you can replot the thing instead of versus L, it's capital, little L over capital L, so that everything is now sitting, can be all plotted here, and you now see the exponential on this side, and the jam on that side. If you expand it, it's a little bit messy, but never mind, if you center this plot and replot, and it's a beautiful gossip that is sitting on there, okay? And square the balance now. <clears throat> so you thought, oh, this is the end of the story. It jams in L equals two, two lanes, it doesn't jam in one. Why? We don't know. But this is not the end of the story. And more surprises, here's the twist. There's a conjecture. The conjecture is in the two lane system, just like the one is homogeneous in the thermodynamic limit. And that's the crucial phrase. And the statement is that the jam will not keep going with L for large enough L and with crossover links beyond those that you have seen so far, say 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 70. So where the hell did 10 to the 70 come from? <laughs> and the answer is, it's based on Monte Carlo plus exact solution of a very similar solution model. It's a very similar model. These guys found the 10 to the 70. 
say, it's some zero or some fancy uh, special function raised to some power and so on. That's how, where that's 10 to 70 comes from. Now, just to let you appreciate what 10 to 70 means, <laughs> the radius, remember we're talking about L, right? This is length, not volume. So, the size of the universe compared to the function is only 10 to 60. So, 10 to 70 is not something we have to worry about in any way of form. And it also has a criterion that they came up with, and the criterion has to do with current, which I won't go into. So this is the conjecture associated with this case. So we try to do something about it. We try to say, well, suppose we um, choose this exchange rate. How often can they overtake each other? Because we know that if they can overtake each other all the time, there will be no jack. And when we take this too low, it will jack. So perhaps we can see that and see what happens. So we start to pick a gamma that is not as small as 0.1 and 0.45, and look at sizes to various things. And here is that uh, resonance distribution again. Remember a big bump means that there's a jam. Here's a microscopic cluster. There's a little jam there. Here's going, going, on. So when you increase the system size, it is certainly consistent with the fact that the microscopic cluster goes away. Forget about this piece. That's just the exponential in the middle. However, it doesn't support it 100%. Here is the uh, so-called phase diagram. We plot gamma here, and we plot the filling task here. Okay? Now, gamma equal to 1 means that you can always overtake. There can be no jam whatsoever. M equal to 0, of course there can be no jam. There are no cost there no jam. So over here is a free flowing state. This is the corner. On the other corner, obviously, you have jams. Okay? And this line in between is the, as far as you can tell by estimating and looking at things like this, where the transition occurs. I shouldn't call it transition, crossover occurs. And this is for different sizes. This part of it certainly is consistent with the hypothesis that as you increase L, the free flowing part eats into the jam part. But if you look over here, you see that the jamming increases. Where does it go up and down? We don't know. Okay. So, uh, in terms of this part. Any questions about this? Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure that quite about it. You mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 description and um, so you allow sideways hopping between the names, right? right? With the additional gamma, I mean, the exchange also existing, right? I mean, uh, let's see. In that case, yeah, probably also gamma. Okay, right. so uh, what, what is it? When? Do you I'm sorry, what? The, the lane exchange is that one, rate one or rate? The lane exchange is always gamma. I think. I mean, gamma is the exchange. Um, the lane exchange is always gamma. Oh. But that's a big question. No, part, I mean, part, the part of the exchange across the lens is gamma. Gamma also. Okay. But part of the whole exchange is one. Are you sure? Well, anyway, we yes. can look it up again. Yes. This, sure. this is done some time ago. So. But that's, uh, that's a very good point because it changes the issue as what gamma is. Okay. Um, regardless of this issue, you may ask, how does the system cause it? How does it get there? Because after all, if it is presently accessible else, it will get to this jam state. So how does this occur? So you can study the time-dependent distance distribution, and you can try to scale it, and you can look at you know, clusters, and you can say that what happens is that in the one by L system, they form very early and then they dissolve. In the two by L system, they start to caution, and it looks like quench crunching uh, the rows, except that it occurs much, much faster. So here's a snapshot of what is going on, so we can appreciate this is kind of like clouds. At the beginning, a county was pretty much all set, they already coming to get into small clusters, and then they start to cross it like that for a true system. Now, um, if you start to plot this, what does it look like? So this is the one main system. At the early times, you have these tiny little clusters forming, and a little bit later, it starts to dissolve. And by the time T equal to 6,000, which is not very far, it has already essentially completely dissolved. It doesn't take long. By contrast, the two I-500, same size. It coarsens, 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 
bang, the market stop because this stop over here. Okay. Now, I should put the two of them on top of each other so you don't get confused. Um, so the previous plot is that here is the one main plot. Everything basically stays over here. The other one just <laughs> jams over. Now, I'm not going to take you through the uh, details of the, uh, the clustering process. So let me just uh, jump to the summary of this fast forking process. Is that for these particular values, what you find is that the cluster growth is g to the two thirds. Now, for those of you who are familiar, especially with ordinary porcelain, g to the one half is quite common. G to the one third is also quite common. But this one is g to the two thirds. And that's why we say that it's much faster than normal. <coughs> Dynamic scaling is OK. The scaling function that we get out of this dynamic thing looks exactly like the one that a theory has been created for a single species. So that's something that is very strange, which we don't really understand, but the model exponent. The scaling function is well, but the exponent is well. If you improve on this particular theory, it gives a pretty good fit to both the exponent and the, L, uh, and the, and the whole scaling function, but this kind of hand-waving way of, you know, changing a theory and so on and so forth is not very satisfactory. So, there is still quite a bit of things to be done. Now, coming now to the last uh, part of this, uh, the, the ABC, I want to talk about later couples. What if you now make the guys prefer one thing or the other? The, suppose you say that the cars and trucks like to stay in the class or the slow lane, what would happen? How do we do this? We simply introduce a key, which is a probability that when you take a pair like this, a pair of sites like this, if you're in the wrong place, you would try to, uh, if you're in the wrong place, you would use P to go to the right place. Okay? So, let's look at P for the zero, means that we don't care. So that's like Jan said before, if you think you see P for the one, that's very obvious because the probability of choosing the right lane is one. So it always goes to the, the, the cars always go to the right, the fast lane and the trucks always go to the slow lane, and you would get nothing. So this is the P for the one case, okay. where all the guys are on the, on the right lane. How we're going to measure this quantity is that um, if you have p equal to zero, there should be an equal mix on the average. If you have p equal to one, you have fewer cars and trucks <coughs> in the right? So we can pick a guy that we call q, that is just the excess, just say the number of cars minus the number of trucks on the fast lane. In this case, because the equal mix, there's no excess. In this case, the number of cars minus the number of trucks is one. That's the Okay? What can you expect this Q to be as you tune this P? Well, you would expect something monotonic like this, right? As you increase P, the Q will start from zero, no mixing, uh, I mean fully mixing, to fully law abiding. In fact, this curve is created by just applying no drive whatsoever, because that's just equilibrium, and that's Boltzmann, and that's very easy to do, and you would get a curve that looks like this. Instead, there is a test. It goes up, and then it makes a little change, and it goes up again. <laughs> and we uh, have uh, not a complete idea of how exactly this happens, but let me show you something even more interesting about the details of what is so special about this point, this point, and then the points associated with this funny change. Okay? So it, it has to do with the profile. Now, what I'm plotting here is the density of cars minus trucks in the fast lane. In other words, this is the excess that we're talking about. Let's look at the light curve that is P equal to zero. That's easy to understand. There is no, out here there are travelers on, on the two lanes, and there's equal mixing. And then you hit the jam, and in the jam, the back of the, the jam, there are more cars, and in the front of the jam, there are more trucks. Okay, is that easy to understand? All right. Now we're going to tune P up to point A. So, four-fifths of the cars prefer to go, four-fifths of the time that the cars prefer to go to the fast lane. So it's not surprising that in the traveling region, you already have a displacement. 
They have more cost in the fast lane than the That's what you expect. So it jams, and of course, in the fast lane, in the jam itself, there are more cars. Not surprising. Okay? What I want to point out to you is that the jams are still aligned, which is not in this picture, and there are excess over there. If you look at this thing very carefully, you see the black is a little bit on this side, and the black is a little bit on that side. And we haven't done it quantitatively as how, how this happens, or oh, oh, to, to, to track how it happens. But the jams get longer when you put in lane preference. Isn't that surprising? At large P, things get even more exciting. So when you start to clean this up, the, the uh, excess, of course, is to be expected, as you would have uh, pointed out. The profiles now has two pieces of the structure. There's a back of the jam when there's a lot more cars, you know, pieced together with a front part of the structure which has a little bit less, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> when you tune up this P, the density of the travelers go down, something that <coughs> is very hard to understand. What is even more interesting is that the jams are offset, in the sense that the, um, if you imagine a whole pile of cars up here and a whole pile of trucks down here, the two jams, before they are aligned. But now the jams are offset like this. Now, um, I hope you have uh, seen this phenomenon already. You are driving a fast car, you are in the fast lane, you run into a jam, there are lots of cars sitting in the fast lane, and you say, gee, there's nothing over there on the slow lane. You move over and go down a little bit and you try to come back. Right? So we don't know whether this thing is a good way already to you know, predict the existence of this kind of phenomenon, or whether there's really psychology involved and things like that. So, let me just make some remarks. Simple model seems to show some effects in the way or not see. The miracle is aggression, it's uh, qualitatively the same behavior, but we really need to have a better understanding of the linear response and better theory to predict what is happening quantitatively. So, what can we look forward to? Well, how about this? Despite the simple simplicity, this model is still, you know, obviously interesting things. Can you have already been raised? What happens if you add more lane? What happens if you go to 13 lanes? What happens if you start to make uh, large trucks and small things? And what happens if you start putting into actions? What happens if you put in gravel patches and roadworks and so on? <laughs> this is totally endless. I should mention at least one uh, other model, which is very popular, but which has nothing to do with cars, is the so-called ABC. This looks like an open football ball with holes and clouds, but no, it's actually three sets of particles in which they are driven in parallel. The A's like to go forward, the B's like to go forward, the C's like to go forward, but A likes to overtake E, B likes to overtake C, and C likes to overtake A. And you thought, gee, this doesn't sound very physical, but never mind, let me look at it, what can happen? What happens is that thing has space transitions, and under certain circumstances, it can even be mapped into a totally equilibrium model with a long-range Hamiltonian, which is what makes it gem. But as soon as you go away from those special points, they're not Hamiltonian, and then you have to you know, wiggle and wiggle and wiggle and so on and so forth. You can obviously go on and talk about multi-species. After all, drivers have very different preferences. It's just not just fast and slow. There's a whole range of them, and you can keep going forever and ever and ever in this direction, right? So in other words, there are many, many more surprises lying in wait. That's what you can look forward to if you want to play this game. So it's good timing that I have five minutes to summarize, and then we can do whatever else. The summary for the whole series is that adding a simple drive to the equilibrium ranking model adds things that uh, you cannot possibly fathom before you start doing it. Even the bare bone system already produced many kinds of amazing phenomena with surprises that we have not been able to fathom in many cases. There are potential applications to a wide range of systems. What we have done so far is to gain a number of little bits of insights here and there, but very far from you know, an, overreaching, uh, an overarching framework for non equilibrium, just like the one that we have for Boltzmann and so on, for equilibrium set now. So, 
you remember those two pictures, equilibrium setback is not an easy subject, but full non-equilibrium is even more further out than that. Uh, the topics here is just a tiny little corner, and given systems is a small part in which the models we present here is just a small fraction of what has been done in DBS with lots of open questions. Obviously, there's lots of work to do, lots of ideas that hopefully you would have that you could pursue, and lots of interesting phenomena that is still waiting to be discovered. What is more crucial is that there are many, many ways to participate in this game. You can do computer simulations. All of you are experts, I'm sure, with this. You can change the rules a little bit of every question that you ask. What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? Just go ahead and do it. See what happens. <laughs> and you would come and say, look, I discovered whatever. <laughs> call it that phenomenon. And usually, uh, this is what happens to us, is that uh, we have a number of undergraduates working with us, and they would take off, and they would do things, and they would come to us, and we would have to scratch our heads and say, what's going on? Anyway, to go beyond that, you can look at all the ordinary differential equations, PDEs, and stochastic differential equations. You can in in integrate them numerically, and you can try to go that way, or you can do analytic work at that level. Obviously, that's a little bit harder. You can go on and do field theory, quantum field theory, statistical field theory, whatever you want to call it. And I put at the bottom the hardest thing that you can have, which is rigorous mathematical methods. So I've started this whole series of lectures with water in this part of the theme, and here are the different levels that you can participate in water sports and come and join in the fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to actually announce we actually have a postdoc opening, so if you really want to join in the fun, come and talk to other people. Yeah. So, more than a couple of times you've mentioned 13 minutes. Yes. Is 13 special and why? Um, the, uh, apparently in cells, this is my understanding, my little understanding of biology, is that you have uh, microtubules in which the motors walk along carrying the whatever is needed from one end to the other end. And uh, I still remember a lecture by uh, one of these guys that says that the, uh, the, uh, one of the cells that controls the, your nerves and the little toes up here, and if you're how the diffusion time it takes to go take the material from here to there will be about the size of the, year, the age of the universe. So and these guys take the material down and they walk on limbs and they're set to around. Yes. Yeah. Since you don't really have a Antonio here, how do you if you turn off the driving, how do you predict the delivery properties? How do you do the Okay, so you're asking English here. So let me just briefly go through, since we have a little bit of time left, let me go through what we do. Okay. And so we do cross training, much like um, uh, Christina has talked to you about. The density of plus particles, the density of minus particles. You write down continuity equation for each. You now decide, postulate how to write down the current. And if you have equilibrium, you will cover up this piece. Okay, just gradient. Actually, you should have some kind of mobility thing in front as well, because it's not just the pressure that drives it, but also mobility. So we do it the most naive way possible, we just put it in drive. What's H? Here comes stuff. In our case, since we, okay, let me just mention the density first. In order to have mobility, you have to, in order for things to move, you have to have some density, and you have to have poles. Why is the is the location of the force, okay? It's just one minus, rho plus minus, rho minus. And in our case, because we have an entirely free thing, the Hamiltonian is just three parts of the free energy, okay? And therefore, it is just whole, not whole, rho, not rho, rho, not rho. So we just put in something like this. If you now start putting in interactions, then you will put some more terms here, okay? It's kind of an entropic part of it. That's precisely. The law of the precisely, precisely. So that's the that's the part of the Hamiltonian that we actually put in, okay? And then you rewrite it in terms of these two densities, and those are the equations that we take. Okay. These things don't look so bad. <laughs> these things look bad just because. <coughs> first of all, that piece we recognize is nothing but unordered. 
and this piece is loaded by saying that if you have mass and you have some charge, then charge term, if it is not zero, then it allows you to move and see what that is. And then this is the part that is, has to do with interdiffusion. If you have two species trying to walk through each other, that's the normal thing that shows up in interdiffusion. And it just comes out of those equations that we saw from the and, and those are the equations that we have. And then from, and what you need to do is to add on the constraint that the integral of the holes is just the size of the system times 1 minus m, m is the mass density, and the integral of the charge density is q. That's what you need to invoke. And then you try to solve this equation. All right? And now what do you do? You look at stationary solutions. The simplest one is the homogeneous one. So you just go back here and you say, oh, if I put phi for the constant, maybe m, or 1 minus m, and put psi for the constant, maybe say 0, then obviously I have 0 on the left hand side. That's easy. All right? Any constant you put here would make 0 on the left hand side. So the homogeneous solution is trivial. It's very easy to do. If you now do linear stability analysis, you would be able to predict the phase boundary. Coordinates in the middle, so they're lost. You would be able to predict the phase boundary. And that phase boundary is, you know, qualitatively the right phase, just like the mean theorizing equation. We write that. The homogeneous one is less trivial. You, you try to look for solutions that is only in the direction of mean, and then you get multi value functions and so on. What you do is you set that equal to zero, and then you uh, uh, once you set that equal to zero, you set this is the mass term, and this is the charge term. And if you have no um, mass for it, if it is uh, neutral, then you have a very simple relationship between psi and phi, and then off you go, and you can calculate more kind of things, and this is the sort of diagram that that theory predicts. I see. So basically, it's and then you add noise for the other thing. So it's going to be the equations plus entropy. So, all right. So, um, is this mean field theory basically exact theory? Oh, no, 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 no. Because the interactions is, is actually in the hard core reaction. It's actually. So, there are, that, th that theory that I showed you is nonlinear. Right? You saw the five and five. It's nonlinear. And therefore, you cannot solve it exactly. I see. So one in principle can do regression theory. Like you can think of this as a hard sphere. Right. Yeah, right. You can do that. But, but that's but this kind of approach doesn't. It's not an easy way to see what you're missing and what you're not missing. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So the the, the, the way you write the Hamiltonian, i.e. the entropic part of the free energy. But you're using it to, to, to study a part of the Euclidean process, and I, I would have thought that with free energy, the entropic part only makes sense when you are close to Euclidean. Right. This right. is equilibrium, it's not sure. No drive. I'm not sure I understand oh, right. what you are driving at, but, right. uh, but you know, there are no interactions with any part of the Any other? Yeah, okay. When you talk about the one lane versus the two lane mm -hmm. difference and how you got jamming in two lanes, mm -hmm. you're sort of identifying it by there being this big clump. Right. But that's a different question than the actual current. I assume the current. Oh, the current drops down like crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about biology. So, um, yeah. do they observe jams in microtubules? I don't know. Well, actually, I don't know enough biology to answer your question. Are there people in the audience? I yes. Yes, good. Um, there okay. are jams sometimes, and there are particularly a lot of jams in neurons in people with Alzheimer's disease. And do you know if there's uh, is, is a global control? Like, if there's a mechanism other than just pure diffusion that controls this type of jams? What do you mean by mechanism other than I mean, uh, you know, some probably common in pure jams. I don't think it's known. What, one thing I could say about my computer is it's very different than when I discussed the preservation law. My understanding is that the motors can hang on all the time and they come off. And every now and then they go back on as well. So you have to imagine what I'm talking about where the particles can disappear from here. And people do study those things. Any other questions? Well, if not, then uh, have dinner and remember there's a post session at 7. You're not done for today, sorry. And I'll uh, see you later.